taxes. Roll a W2 and pass it. Smoke it down to a pile of ashes. Man, fuck all that math shit. Welcome to Economists Are Dumb, hosted by me, an economist. In this episode, I'll answer the question that I'll pretend you asked. Why come we pay taxes? The answer seems obvious, how else would the government pay for things? But if you've seen the previous video in my series on money, you'll know that governments don't actually use tax dollars to pay for things. I left that video on a bit of a cliffhanger by not explaining why we pay taxes, and this video is the answer. To understand why we pay taxes, we need to go over the history of money. And the story you've been told by mainstream economists is one big fat lie. Bring it It's 1776, and a sued named Adam Smith begins his inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations with the origins of money. In summary, it's as follows. In the earliest days, humans would specialize. Everyone would make what they were good at making. Then, we are told, when the guy who spent all day making bread needs a shoe for his horse, he would hope that the guy who spent all day making horseshoes would want bread, and they would trade. This system was called barter. This was then so inconvenient, we are also told, that instead of trading a bunch of different stuff, everyone started trading something that everyone else wanted, like gold or salt. This was then the end of barter and the beginning of commodity money. The guy who made bread would trade bread for salt and then salt for horseshoes. Then people got tired of lugging around all this salt every place, so they put it in one place and just traded ownership of parts of it. You would put your salt in the salt bank and get a piece of paper saying, whoever holds this paper has the right to withdraw this much salt from the salt bank, and use those pieces of paper to trade instead. This is called representative money, because each piece of paper represented an amount of salt. An economist would say that it was backed by salt. Both commodity money and the representative money that replaced it were something which emerged naturally from the market. Then, big government came in and decided to make the money not backed by anything, and through some miracle, everyone decided to just keep using it, because they had faith in the government that issued it. This is called fiat money, and we are told that everyone uses it because we trust that everyone else uses it. It is said to be backed by the faith that people have in the government. This was when the government stepped in and started fiddling with natural markets. And why do we pay taxes? Well, the government needs to be able to pay for stuff, so it takes some of the money from the economy. Nice story, but all of it is wrong. And not wrong because it's a simplification of the true story, this story of money is just a flat-out lie, with zero archaeological, anthropological, or historical evidence. Let's go through why the story, literally every single part of it, is incorrect. Maybe get yourself a nice cup of tea, and then settle down while we get ready to own the libs with facts and logic. Adam Smith, longtime cringe poster, is the modern origin of the story that we are all told about the history of money. He starts his story by describing barter, but the idea that humans used to barter is just flat out wrong. An anthropologist named Caroline Humphrey conducted the most thorough investigation of barter out in the real world, that place that economists hate more than anything, and found, to quote, no example of a barter economy, pure and simple, has ever been described, let alone from it the emergence of money. All available ethnography suggests that there has never been such a thing. Hard to be more straightforward than that. And she's far from the first. As long ago as the 1800s, people were debunking Adam Smith's nonsense, but neoclassical economists seem to always ignore evidence which proves them wrong and keep perpetuating their lies. The only places we do find bartering, where one person exchanges something they have for something else that someone else has, is in societies where people are already very familiar with money, or very, very rarely between groups who expect to never see each other again or are outright enemies. And a lot of the time it involves a massive orgy. If people didn't barter, what did they do then? Well, they used credit. If you're a neoclassical economist, this may be quite shocking to you. You were taught that credit was the last and most recent stage in the evolution of money. In reality, it is the oldest form of money, by far. It's so old, in fact, that we don't even know how old it is. It's probably at least as old as Homo sapiens. The oldest interest-bearing loans actually predate writing. So what exactly is credit? 
In the simplest terms, credit is just your relationship with other people. It's how nice and trustworthy you are, or how credible you are, and how connected you are to the community. This includes everything about you, not just the physical goods that you produce in exchange. It might seem a bit odd, but throughout most of human history, credit encompassed everything you did. There was no separation between physical goods and your moral character. All of it was how credible you were, how trustworthy you were. Let's go back to the example we had at the start, where we have someone who bakes bread and someone who makes horseshoes. Imagine you are the horseshoe maker. You live in a community of less than a few hundred people. You go to the baker because you need a loaf of bread to feed your family. The baker just gives it to you. But now you owe him one. One what? Well, one. He knows who you are, you live in the same community, you have a relationship, and that is what's being used to exchange, in this instance, bread. If you do this every day, as is likely since you don't bake bread, you make horseshoes, you'll start owing him two or three. You'll be running up a tab. You're not paying him with physical money. You're just becoming, essentially, indebted to him. You're paying with credit. Later on, he comes to your horseshoe shop and needs new shoes for his horse. You both know each other, and so when you give him a horseshoe, you both understand that he now owes you one. But instead of this, he just marks down the tab that you owe him. You've paid him back for the one that you owed him. Once you've given him enough horseshoes, or done him enough favors, or given him literally anything that you both can agree on, then you're back on equal footing. No one owes anyone anything. And that's it. That's credit. That's how goods and services, and literally everything, was exchanged for the lion's share of human history, for the lion's share of humans, across societies. Goods weren't exchanged at the same time. Barter isn't even necessary or desirable. This is why it only happens between enemies or strangers, or people you don't expect to ever see again, because you don't have a social interaction with them. There's no personal relationship. They're not credible. Let's say you and the baker knew each other a bit less, though. You didn't have that much trust. Or you were dealing with much larger amounts of things, or things which were much more valuable. You might not want to leave this all as ambiguous as it is, where both of you just remember how much you owe each other. In this case, you can use something called a tally stick. This is just a piece of wood. You and the baker cut some notches into it, the amount of ones that you owe him, and then split it roughly in half, like this. The bigger half tells you who is owed, and is called the stock. The person holding it is the stockholder. If there is ever a disagreement over how much you owe each other, you just line up the halves of the stick. Once it comes time to repay, the stick gets snapped in half, and again, you're on equal footing. This might seem a little ludicrous and hard to believe, but that's just because you've been taught a flat-out lie by neoclassical economists your whole life. What's harder for me to believe is that seemingly only a single neoclassical economist ever considered the possibility that deferring payments would have made barter unnecessary, and that all the rest thought that every exchange between people who literally lived in the same community for their entire lives had to do spot trades. Maybe this tells us how strong of a relationship these economists had with other people they knew. This system of credit and tally sticks isn't just from the ancient world, either. The Bank of England kept its own internal accounting as tally sticks until 1826. A reminder that Adam Smith, who lived in the UK, died in 1790, meaning that the National Bank of his home country used tally sticks for literally his entire life and then 36 years afterwards. The system of credit in this form really only ended when global capitalism took over. Before that, whenever we found a society, it was usually the case that everyone was in debt to everyone else, and all of the transactions took place without physical currency. So barter never existed. But what about the other forms of money? My story ends the same way it begins. I refuse to do my taxes again. I went to h and block with a raging hard cock. Slammed it on the desk and said, Suck. As a refresh, the standard story of money is that humans moved from bartering to commodity money. There was something that everyone saw as valuable, and when everyone began bartering just with that, it became money. Well, we just saw that bartering never actually happened. So what about commodity money? Adam Smith brings up some examples of it in his book. Dried cod in Newfoundland and tobacco in Virginia and nails in Scotland were all apparently used as money. But when people actually went to the places that Adam Smith was talking about, they found out that he was, again, wrong. These people were really just using credit. They were much more precise in how they calculated how much they owed each other, though. All of these people were very familiar with money already and were even using money as a unit of account. 
In reality, these people would just pay debts in something that everyone else seemed to have or need. The commodity wasn't actually acting as money though, it was just something everyone accepted as payment for debts that were tallied in money. Let's look at the dried cod in Newfoundland. In the early days of the Newfoundland fishing industry, there was no permanent European population. The fishermen went there for the fishing season only, and those who were not fishermen were traders who bought the dried fish and sold to the fishermen their daily supplies. The fishermen sold their catch to the traders at the market price in pounds, shillings, and pence, and obtained, in return, a credit on their books, with which they paid for their supplies. So dried cod was not a commodity that everyone was using as money. It was credit that everyone was using to buy and sell things and the credits and debts could be cancelled out by exchanging commodities. Many of those commodities were dried cod. The idea that the colony of Virginia used tobacco as money comes from a law designating it as legal tender, but the law was really just forcing merchants to accept tobacco as credit for debts that the planters incurred. Instead of these debts being notches on a tally stick, they were much more exact. Like the fishermen and traders in Newfoundland, the Virginia colonists would keep track of their debts and credits in precise amounts using pounds, shillings, and pence. But the planters didn't have to pay their debts in tobacco. They could be, and were, paid with anything that they had around. The law just made sure that tobacco was something that everyone had to accept, since the planters had quite a bit of it. So really, these examples of commodity money are just old-fashioned credit systems that humans have always done. As for the nails in Scotland, the same thing was happening. But why nails? Well, people in Scotland would work at factories, where they would produce things, but instead of being paid in money, they would just be allowed to take home a portion of what they produced, or whatever scraps there were on the floor. No one actually went into restaurants or bars and paid for things by putting a pile of nails on the ground, it was just the nails that had value and so could be given at some point in the future to debts that they had accrued in order to pay them off. But why didn't the people working at factories during the Industrial Revolution get all of what they produced? Why just a portion? Good question. So really, these examples of commodity money are really just the old-fashioned credit system that humans have always done. If we go back to more ancient examples, we also see the same thing. Smith could not have known about the economics of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia because he died in 1790, and it was after his death that we translated the artifacts from that time most of which were, by the way, financial documents. But they too worked entirely on credit and debt. Mesopotamia had prices denominated in silver, making you think that they used commodity money. But the silver just stuck around in temples for thousands of years. The temples would declare that a bushel of barley was worth a certain amount of silver, not because people were paying for things with barley or silver, but so that bureaucrats running the temple could keep track of resources and debts in a standardized way. A pound of silver, or whatever amount it was, was just their unit of account used for everything. There were fixed prices and they were measured in pounds of silver. It may have even been the case that a pound of silver was measured in so many pounds of silver. Debt may have been measured in silver, but it didn't have to be paid in silver. It could be paid with literally anything, and barley was what the peasants in Mesopotamia had, just like debt in Newfoundland didn't have to be paid in cod, and debt in Virginia didn't have to be paid with tobacco. So no, commodity money didn't exist either, and this has been known for quite some time. The examples that Adam Smith mentions were debunked in the 1800s, but it has yet again been ignored by neoclassical economists so that they don't have to change their worldview. But what about ancient coins? The traditional story of money is that in places where gold and silver was commodity money, the local king would begin standardizing the precious metals into small coins to assure people of their value. We have tons of coins from the ancient world which are made of gold and silver. Is this a death blow to my explanation of the history of money, and does it make the neoclassical one more credible? Well, we'll see about these coins. So credit was used for the vast majority of transactions throughout history. But say you didn't have a personal relationship with the guy that you were dealing with. In that case, you may use coins created by the state, but this was kind of very rare. In fact, it's only around 600 BC in the Greek city-state of Miletus that we find the first evidence of any coin from anywhere in the world being minted with a small enough denomination that it could be used for everyday transactions. Most transactions, even in the presence of coins, still used credit. And these ancient coins are not all that you are told they're cracked up to be. 
Ancient coins, just like modern ones, circulated at values that were well above the value of the precious metal that they contained. Our first piece of evidence that the traditional story of money is wrong. Why would this be the case if the coins were being used as commodity money, if they were actually representing standardized amounts of gold or silver or whatever else it was? Along with this, the view that kings would standardize the coins they made is not backed up by any evidence. Ancient coins were highly, highly irregular in both size and composition. When they had a value stamped on them, something which was also quite rare in the ancient world, coins of the same value would sometimes have twice as much precious metal in them as others. Early 20th century historians proposed theories which accounted for this by saying that it must have been the average weight of the coins that was used as the standard. But this is insane if you think about it. While it's possible for all of these coins to be circulating at a price above the value of the precious metal in them, none of them could be circulating at a price below the value of the metal, or they would simply be melted down. And in fact, we have huge amounts of actual historical evidence that these coins all did circulate at a price well above the value of the precious metal in them, at least within the borders of the state that issued them. So no, these coins were not being used as commodity money. And in fact, most of the ancient and medieval coins never actually existed. Let me explain. Long after the collapse of the Roman Empire, the feudal kingdoms that would replace it still tabulated their taxes and prices in Roman coins. Not the physical Roman coins, mind you, just the names of the coins were used to record debts. None of these kingdoms were actually minting any of these Roman coins. And then, after the Carolingian Empire fell, people continued to use their money, even explicitly calling it imaginary money. Many of the coins people used to total up how much money was owed to them and how much they owed never even existed. Like how in Canada, prices are calculated to the penny, despite pennies not being minted, and in the US, gas prices are calculated to the nearest tenth of a cent, despite no coin for that existing. Or, my personal favorite, how the New York Stock Exchange, until 1997, listed stock prices to the eighth of a dollar, and then later changed to the sixteenth of a dollar, despite there not being any coins or bills for those amounts either. During the reign of King Henry II of England, who died in 1189, almost all of Western Europe was still using the money system that was created by Charles the Great, or, if you're French and then English, Charlemagne. Charlemagne died 350 years before Henry II, but all of Europe still saw fit to calculate all of their debts and credits in the coin system that he created. The coins were pounds, shillings, and pence. Yes, those pounds. And yet again, we find that the shillings and pence that Charlemagne did mint varied widely in size, weight, purity, and value. But best of all, Charlemagne never even struck a coin representing a silver pound, let alone one that contained a pound of silver. So no, early coins were not created to standardize the value of a commodity that everyone was using as money. They had prices well above the value of what was in them while they were within their own state's borders. Two death blows via historical evidence, and a large amount of it, to the standard story from neoclassical economics about the origin of money. Coins were just tokens, not actually things which had value because of the metal they contained. Coins were just representations of an amount of credit and debt, just like tally sticks, or just like the coins we have now. This also means that representative money is nothing like how neoclassical economists think it is either. If the coins made of precious metal themselves didn't contain enough precious metal, why would one expect there to be an accurate accounting of the precious metals being kept at banks? In Mesopotamian times, there almost certainly was. The temples that housed the metals were vast industrial complexes that had the goal of making sure they knew how much of each material they had. Maybe. Remember that the silver stored in the temples remained untouched for thousands of years. But in the United States, which neoclassical economists like to call the most trustworthy currency issuer in the world, when currency used to be exchangeable for gold, back when we were on the gold standard, the lowest that the ratio of bills issued which were backed by gold to actual gold in the reserves was 4 to 1. 4 to 1! And for the latter part of the gold standard, American citizens didn't even have the right to redeem their money for gold. The traditional, and wrong, story told by economists is that coins made of gold arose because everyone valued gold, and the local king wanted everyone to trust that there was the correct amount of gold within the coins, so he would stamp his face on it as a mark of authority and standardization, and people could trust in the purity of the coins. But if one considers this, it makes no sense. 
Not only because we know that this isn't how ancient coins worked, and this isn't how money came about, and we have no evidence of such standardization ever happening throughout history, despite the technology to do so being widely available to all states that issued coins, but because it doesn't logically make sense. The story can't explain why we pay taxes, or why any of these ancient societies paid taxes. Let's walk through it. If you ask one of these neoclassical economists why governments make people pay taxes, they will say the answer is obvious. How else would the government get money? Now, we know that in reality, the government could just use tallies like any other member of society, and in fact we have a huge amount of evidence that the ancient societies did do this. Money was just owing someone something, and it was created between people when one gave something to the other, and was destroyed when the other gave something back to them in return. But let's entertain the neoclassical notion. So the government taxes its citizens so that it can get money. But if the economists are right, and money came about through some natural process of the free market, where gold and silver became commonly accepted commodity money, wouldn't the obvious thing to be just, as the government, take control of the gold and silver mines with your, you know, army? In that case, you would have literally all the money you could ever want. And in fact, governments throughout time did do this. We have evidence of it. So then what's the purpose, if you have all of this gold, which is inherently valuable apparently, of stamping your face on it, sending it out to circulate among your citizens, and then demanding that your citizens give some of it back to you? At last, we can answer the question, why do we pay taxes? As stated before, the use of gold as a form of commodity money, and indeed gold coins as a standardization of this practice, did not come about through some natural process starting with barter. In fact, markets themselves don't come about naturally. Societies which don't have states also don't have markets. This is something else that neoclassical economists have lied to you about. Implicit in their models and understanding of the world is that markets actually exist naturally, and that states step in to manipulate them as some sort of foreign actor. But this is just not true. The truth is that markets are created by states. If a king wants to control the resources in his territory, one of the easiest ways to do it is with markets. David Graeber gives the following story to explain. Say a king wishes to support a standing army of 50,000 men. Under ancient or medieval conditions, feeding such a force was an enormous problem. Unless they were on the march, one would need to employ almost as many men and animals just to locate, acquire, and transport the necessary provisions for the army. On the other hand, if one simply hands out coins to the soldiers, and then demands that every family in the kingdom had to pay one of those coins back to you, one would turn one's entire national economy into a vast machine for provisioning soldiers, since now every family, in order to get the hands on their coins, must find some way to contribute to the general effort of providing soldiers with things that they want. It's a nice story, simple and makes sense, and the best part is that it's true. We have large amounts of evidence for markets springing up around ancient armies from around the world, which neoclassical economics ignores. Let's go back to that scenario where you're the blacksmith and your friend is the baker. You each are running up tabs on each other, and with the other people in town. Remember that you don't ever exchange any physical money, you just keep track of how much money you owe the baker for the loaves of bread that he gave you, and how much he owes you for the horseshoes that you gave him. This is all fine and good, until April 15th when Uncle Sam comes knocking and says, Hey, you owe me this many US dollars. Well now you're fucked. You haven't been using US dollars at all. You've been using a system of credit and debt and interpersonal relationship. Basically just trust. So next year you get wise. You tell your friend the baker that if he wants some tools off you, he's gonna have to pay for them with US dollars. And your friend, the baker, he's like, where, where am I going to get US dollars? The answer? You have to go to someone who the US government has already given US dollars, and exchange with them something that you have that they want. Whoever has the US dollars now has incredible power and can take resources from other areas of the economy, and the state, the US government, determined who that was. Turns out, in our example, that the only person the US government gave any US dollars to was a war company, or as we call them nowadays, a defense contractor. The US government bought a bunch of war equipment and paid with US dollars. So you, the blacksmith, in order to be able to pay your taxes, have to start producing stuff that this war company wants to buy. And the only reason that this war company has the power to take the resources that you would otherwise use to make other things is that the government created money and gave it to the war company. 
And the only reason that you will accept this new money for things is because you have to pay some of it back to the US government. This is the creation of markets. States create markets in order to control resources. They don't appear on their own. The market system of distribution that we have right now has completely replaced what was previously just a system of credit and interpersonal lending. Money, in its earliest form of just credit between neighbors, was trust. You give your friend bread that they need because you know that they will give you the horseshoes that you need. You keep track of it using numbers to make sure that you don't have disagreements over who was what to who, but it's still just the relationship you have with each other that's governing the exchange of everything. Once the state started issuing money and brought markets into every part of society, tallies largely stopped being used, along with the system of interpersonal credit and debt. We would no longer use our interpersonal relationships to exchange goods and services. This use of money and taxes by the state to control resources is actually the name where this type of money comes from. Money issued by the state is called fiat money. Fiat is Latin for let it be done, or more accurately translated, it was used in medieval times to issue commands or proclamations. That passage in Genesis, which is quite famous, begins with fiat lux in Latin, or let there be light. It's command money. Money is power after all, power in the form of getting people to do things they otherwise wouldn't do, like make you stuff and do stuff for you. Neoclassical economists will always talk about money by what it's backed by, and fiat money is always discussed as being backed by the faith in the government that issued it. In their worldview, the state is, again, almost a foreign and always harmful actor which interferes in otherwise halcyon markets. We used to use real money, based on commodities. Then we had representative money, which was just an easier way of keeping track of who owned the commodity money. And now the state came in and ruined all of that and made all of our money worthless. This is, of course, nonsense. The earliest thing that we could call money was credit, and was based entirely on the trust between people, not some central authority. And we've seen that neoclassical economists are just plain wrong about barter, commodity money, and representative money. Neoclassical economics also can't explain why people would use the money in the first place. Their argument, usually, for why people use US dollars is that everyone else uses US dollars. This circular logic is not only published in textbooks, but also economics journals, and is treated like gospel. It's a disgrace, in my opinion, to those who tout it, and also just inane. Can you imagine this sort of reasoning getting published in a reasonable field like chemistry or physics or non-neoclassical economics? Circular logic? Really? And you call yourself a scientist? Imagine you and everyone else stopped using US dollars. That's all well and good, until April 15th comes around and the largest military force in the world, and also the entity with a monopoly on violence, says that you owe it US dollars. Taxes drive the use of money. It's taxes that result in markets even existing in the first place. Taxes give the state power over resources and people within its territory. That's all that money is. It's just who has power. What is debt but the corruption of a promise? Money is just the power to get people to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do, and to get commodities that you otherwise wouldn't have. Before the widespread use of state money, the power that you or anyone else in society had to get what they needed was based entirely on trust and honor and being part of a society, of a community. It was how trustworthy or honorable you were. Not saying that that was anywhere near perfect, as people went into literal debt slavery all the time, but that's just how it was. The reason we pay taxes is that otherwise no one would use the money that the state created. Think about if you started issuing money. No one would use it. But if you have a big gun and you can force people to pay some of it back to you, they might start using that money for things. The reason that early states made coins out of precious metal was not because that the precious metals were inherently valuable, it was just so that people would find it incredibly hard to counterfeit the state's money. It didn't want people to be able to have power to command resources away from its goals using its own money. This is why coins circulated within the borders of the state that issued them at a much higher price than the precious metals within them. Within the state, they were tokens, which would allow you to avoid the wrath of tax delinquency. Inside the state, they were money. Outside the state, they were just some lump of metal. This is why states make you pay taxes. Because without taxes, there would be no reason for you to use the money that they issue. And without you using the money they issue, they have no control over economic resources that they don't directly own. And it's not just states that create their own money. Up until recently, companies used to issue their own money too, for the same reason of controlling resources and people. If you own the only general store in town, and all the land, and all the houses, and charge your own money for rent and food, then it's easy to see why people would start working for you, since you're the only place to get the money that you're forced to buy everything in. This is also exactly what happened during colonization. 
Before the capitalist empires began taking over the entire world, societies had a vast myriad of economic systems, but colonizers would quickly impose taxes on the native population as a way of controlling every aspect of their lives and taking over their local society. After all, what's a bigger part of your life than what you work for and what you buy? The story we are all told by neoclassical economists about the history of money is wrong. It's littered with ideological nonsense and long disproven beliefs. The truth of the history of money is this. Human societies naturally produce and exchange goods based on need through a system of interpersonal relationships. This is called society. This is often codified in credit using abstract units. When Alice gives things to Bob, Bob is indebted to Alice. When Bob gives things to Alice, the debt he owes her is lowered. To keep track of these debts with many people, tally sticks were used throughout history up until quite recently. These debts may exist in quite arbitrary units, or may be tallied in terms of some other good which has a fixed value relative to all the other goods. If Alice owes Bob five pounds of silver, she can give him ten cows, because Alice and Bob determined that ten cows is worth five pounds of silver. In order to gain control over resources within their territory, states would issue their own money and require that it be paid back in the form of taxes. Whoever was given the money they created would have power to shift resources from people toward their interests because they had what the state would later demand in taxes. In doing so, the first markets, as we understand them, came into being. There has never been a society of barter, money has never developed from it, and markets only exist because of the presence of the state or other entities which are equally powerful. This is why the state makes you pay taxes, because without taxes, there would be no reason for you to use the money that it issued. 